Gamble Ramble. It's your old pal Archie Gamble here. And as always, I am your host, producer, director, creator, etc., etc., of the Gamble Ramble vlog. And I welcome you to my YouTube channel. Thank you for returning. If you're a regular subscriber, if you're new here, welcome. And uh, my name is Glenn Archie Gamble, as I said. And I am a career musician from London, Ontario, Canada. Been at it for about 40 years. And I played everything from cover tribute bands to signed international recording acts to cruise ship work, uh, session player, sideman. I've worked in music store, you know, retail stores, uh, record stores, uh, road managed bands. So I've a lot of experience in different facets of the music industry and they use this channel to talk about them. So some of the bands have been over the years and um, most famous are probably the band Helix from Canada, which is a legendary Canadian hard rock band on Capitol EMI Records. Um, and then a band called The Joys for a few years that did well. Fairly recently I played with a co-produced country artist named uh, Aaron Allen, who had some success chart-wise in Canada. And uh, probably though my my most proud thing that could you know the band I consider most of my too hard would be a band called the Buffalo Brothers and I'm gonna show you up here right there see behind me those keep your heads those are from the Buffalo Brothers days now Buffalo Brothers was uh, an original recording act that was signed to Attic Universal Records were signed to Attic and and. Uh, Universal was a distributor parent company, and that was that's where my uh, my heart and soul lie. Like that was the true definition of a band for me. We were all contributing equally contributing members for a way street if there ever was one, you know. So today's topic, what we're going to talk about is how that band evolved, and I've called today, as you can see by the title, "What's in the Name," for a reason because Buffalo Brothers was the last name that we used in our career as a four-piece band. But it evolved through a bunch of different names. And so I'll, I'll explain. Essentially what happened was we started out as a four-piece cover band back in 1989, okay? Yes, kids, I'm not old. Um, and what had happened was that Sean Sanders, who was the singer, guitar player at Buffalo Brothers, and there was also Mike Benalla keyboards, Stan Fountain on bass, and myself. So established that. Sean Sanders and myself in 1987 played in a band called Vandal from Sioux St. Marie, Ontario. And this was a working band that played all across Canada 50 weeks a year, 51 weeks a year sometimes. The circuit back then you could work 52 years, 52 weeks a year if you wanted to. Every week of the year, every day of, pretty much every day of the year if you wanted to. But we always took a week off of the summer and a week off of Christmas. So we typically worked 50, excuse me, 50 weeks a year. And uh, Sean was from Wallsburg, Ontario, and I was from London. The rest of the band was from Sault Ste. Marie. So I got to know them uh, as they were a very popular cover band that used to come through Brantford. When they needed a drummer, they asked me, and we had become friends at this point. That's how I met Sean. So I was in Vanda for about two years, and it was a great learning career. But I was 18 years old when I joined. I wasn't even old enough to be in the bars that I was playing in. But we were playing full-time, traveling back and forth across the country, and it taught me a lot of lessons. And eventually, you know, as things happened, I was pretty immature, pretty young. Probably wasn't the easiest person to live with. I was basically an overgrown kid. Um, and they wanted to go in a more progressive rock direction. They wanted to be able to do rush covers and things like that. And I'm... Not that kind of drummer. I'm a very straightforward meat potatoes rock and roll drummer. And so I was fired, which devastated me and uh, broke my heart. I was 21 years old. I thought my world was over, you know, and just about to turn 21, maybe like 20 ish. And I remember the night before I left, Sean, who had not agreed with the band vote to fire me, him and I, <laughs> we had drunk. After the gig, and we had but we were in Winnipeg. We had to be uh, in the sauna at the hotel, drinking together, crying. I remember him saying, "Buddy, it's not going to be the same without you. I, it will. I'll be right behind you. I got a feeling it won't, I won't be here much longer." So I left, and Sean stayed with Vandal. And sure enough, it didn't last much longer. They ended up breaking up. 
Uh, the new drummer was a real uh, fly in the ointment, apparently. Like, he was hard to get along with. He was a great player, but uh, technically he overplayed and they, he was a demanding diva. Uh, how'd that work out for you guys? Pretty good, right? Should have stuck with what you knew. But anyway, I'm not bitter, though I was. So the point being that, uh, you know, I, I went home and I went back to Brantford where I grew up and my brother, older brother Jim, Miss you, love you, was, uh, was um, working in a, a, a factory manufacturing plant that made barbecue propane tanks, cadet engineering at Brantford. And he was on the floor as like the, uh, I don't know what you call it, supervisor, right? So he helped get me a job. And you gotta remember, this is the late 80s, right? I like skinny pants, you know, skinny jeans as they call them now. We weren't called that, they were just called tight pants. Big Bon Jovi hair, and I was, I was about this big around, working in a blue collar, blue collar environment. You used to call me Bon Jovi, right? Your co workers. But I vowed, that's it. I'm done with bands. My heart got so broken by Vandal. So I was pursued at this time by a band called Nasty Class. And the leader and creator of that band was a great, great guy by the name of Tim McFadden. Not of Tim like family to this day. Tim was from Wallaceburg. Also, the, and it was a friend of Sean Sanders. So when Vandal had played the Wallsburg area and shot him, we, Tim would come out and we became friends. I got to know him through Sean. Tim contacted me. I'm working in this factory. Was living in my father's apartment and my father was in jail. <laughs> we won't even get into this, but I was watching his apartment while he was gone away. And working in the factory and hating my life, working nights on my dad, 11 till 7. Having these. 50, they weigh 15 pounds each, these propane tanks, two of a time off the line and stacking them on pallets. My arms are about this big around. I used to have repetitive motion dreams. I would wake up doing my job, literally. And it was awful. I, I hated my life. Tim called me and asked me if there was forming a bank on Nasty Class or had formed a bank on Nasty Class to go out work on the circuit and he wanted me to play drums after seeing me with Vandal. I was very flattered by this. Um, and he said, well, look, we're playing Toronto in the band together. Um, well, first he had asked me to do it, and I said, no, I, just, I was, heart, forgive me. My heart was broken, and I said, no, I don't want to, you know. He goes, well, you know, come and see us play. I'll explain this in a second, and we can talk. So what happened was, Tim was in a band at that time when he asked me called Passion Play was Stan Fountain, who ended up in Buffalo Brothers and Nasty Class, and Mike Bunnell. So three girls and three guys in Passion Play, great band. They came to play Toronto at the place called the Gasworks. So what happened was, Brantford's only an hour from Toronto. So what they did was they came to stay at my apartment, crashing on the floor and two to a bed and stuff like that. And I went back to Toronto with them on the second night to see the band, because the plan was for them three to leave with me and form Nasty Class. That's what they wanted to do with another singer. And I went out and saw them, and they, of course, they were fantastic, right? Great band. All of them were really good players, but I just thought, you know, I was still um, hurt from being fired from Vandal, and, and just, you know. And I'll tell you another story. I've never said this out loud. I hope if Stan's listening, he doesn't take this the wrong way. I love Stan's family. But it's funny because Stan's a very, you'll never meet anyone like him, he's got an amazing sense of humor, but I didn't know how to take him at first. I found him really abrasive because he was just very forward and, and very uh, direct, said exactly what was on his mind, which are qualities now that I appreciate and love in him. But at the time I was like, who is this guy? He's very, he's no wallflower, that's for sure. And it kind of put me off a little bit, although he was an amazing musician and a good guy. I just thought, you know what, I feel like I'm ready to jump back to the dynamics of living together with four other guys again and two, six, including the crew. So I said, no, okay. And I went back onto the road and I went back to my job. And I regretted it almost instantly because I was absolutely miserable. I'm, I'm a musician, it's all I'm good at, it's all I want to do, and it's what I was meant to do. So I got a call back a few months later from Tim again, and it was on the road, somebody goes, listen, aren't you please? This drummer's driving us fucking crazy. I won't mention his name. We want to fire him. Please get out here. We need you. And I said, this time I was ready. I said, Dude, I'm in. 
So they sent me the song list and a bunch of board tapes, cassette tapes from the from the mixing board of the live show. They recorded the show so I could learn the arrangements of the songs and the beginnings and endings and stuff. And I did. I started to work on the material. And I was ready to get back to it at this point. And uh, so I joined. I took the train. Oh, sorry. Sorry, the train was Vandal. A friend of mine drove me up to Chelmsford, Ontario. Chelmsford, uh, Chelmsford Inn, is that what it is? Which is outside of Sudbury. Which, ironically, is the place I started my career with Vandal, was uh, in Chelmsford, too. And uh, we drove up there with my drums. And I worked with the band. We used to do a week at a time back then in a place. So you would either do six nights, Monday to Saturday, in a club, or you do what they call the front half, which was Monday to Wednesday, and then a back half, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, sometimes Sunday. But we would do a whole week, whole weeks up north. And we would start off work a week here, you know, a week in Sudbury, work in a week in Timmins, a week in Thunder Bay, a week in Winnipeg, a week in Saskatoon, and you work your way westward and, and then eastward again. So I do best, as I do, as I tend to do. So I went up there, and the way we worked it was the drummer, uh, they would get me up to play a couple songs on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, to the point where uh, first I, when I was ready, I played, we would rehearse in the afternoon in the, in the bar when it was closed. I would play one set, the drummer would play the last two. The next night I would play first and second set, the drummer would play the last one. Until we're at the point where I could play the whole night and we sent this guy home, okay? So then Nasty Class went on. And it was myself, Tim McFadden, uh, Stan Fountain, uh, Mike Bennell, and the sing singer, great singer, great guy by the name of Russ Crosskirk. So, after a while of being in this band, our wonderful, illustrious keyboard slash guitar player, Mike Bennell, decided that he didn't want to be on the road anymore. He didn't like touring. He was never really one that was cut out for it. And I can understand that now in retrospect. I never got it at the time that Howard even could hate touring, but he just didn't like it. So, he left. And it turned out that Vandal had broken up. Now, the intro of Vandal, I always hated them. I resented the hell out of them for this. They went to do a three month winter residency in Puerto Rico, which I missed out on after I got fired. I was so bitter about that for years. Anyway, so I said, well, look, why don't we, Tim and I talked about it. I said, why don't we just get another guitar player instead of a keyboard player? Well, I played keyboards and a bit of guitar, but it's main, mainly keyboards. And I said, Sean's available. And we both had the same thought. And Sean was a great harmony singer. So we got Sean, called him up, he said, you know, you gotta remember that time when your kids out playing full time on the road. You're playing, you don't have an address, you don't have an apartment back home. You're home for a week off, once or twice a year, you go stay with your family. You're 18, 19, 20 years old. You play music six nights a week, meeting girls, getting paid to do the thing you love, partying every night. It was a great life. And when it ends, you don't want it to end. So back then, it wasn't hard to convince Sean to come join this band. I was in it, Tim and his lifelong friend was in it. It was perfect. So Sean came out to play guitar, him and Tim to play dual lead guitar, and to sing harmonies with Tim. So what happened was eventually Russ, who was a great singer, and he was very clear operatic type voice, like thick Queen Drake, Boston, that kind of singer. But the problem was he was blowing his voice out a lot. He was losing his voice a lot. So it was really sad, but the band decided to fire him. And how it had happened the nights when he would lose his voice, Sean would take over because Sean was a very talented singer who didn't consider himself a singer at the time. He was just a guitar player. But he ended up covering for, for Ra, Russ all the time. And next thing you know, he's gone and we're a four-piece band. Sean front and center on guitar, Tim stage left on guitar, or stage right on guitar, and Stan stage left on bass. And that was Nasty Glass, and the version that stayed like that, okay? So, that's the basic long backstory is done. I'll conclude it real quick by telling us awkward story. So when we let Russ go, Dean, our sound man, who owned the lights and the, and the PA, and did the sound, hired Russ to do follow spot with the band, which was really awkward and really stupid looking back on it. We paid him, we, he worked for us, we were kids and he was older than us, so we didn't say anything. But it was awkward carrying this guy around with us, who used to be at the front and center of the stage, 
and was now operating the spotlight. It wasn't fair to him and it wasn't fair to us. It created this tension. We never should have allowed it, but we didn't know better. And eventually we just said, look, he's gotta go home. And it happened. And I felt bad for Russ and Russ, if by chance you ever get to see this, it was never about you. You're a fucking great guy and a great singer. It was just about the vocal issues of, 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 of not maintaining your voice at the time, which is a physical problem. And I understand I've had issues in my ears over the years where I've been let go from bands. Bad though, that was one of the reasons, right? It's beyond your control. But you were a soldier, a trooper, and a brother. And I love you and I hope you know that. So, it's a four-piece four nasty class. Carries on, okay? And we worked all the freaking time, pretty much every night of the week. And we decided originally, we sat down and said, you know what? We gotta start writing music. Because if you wanna have a career in music, ultimately you have to sign you know, a record deal, put out albums, and, and become a real band. So that's what we, we started doing. We started demoing material. Now right around this time, 1990-91, the circuit that we were on started to dry up, okay? And I'll put some worksheets here to show you what it was like back then, how crazy our work schedule was. But bars were not having bands as much anymore. Bars were live music bars were closing. Venues were getting smaller. Stages were getting smaller. We're carrying around all this production that cost us thousands of dollars a week in a five-ton truck that we were paying for and gas for that too. Never mind the band van. It was an expensive proposition. So we said, this is the perfect time. You know what we're gonna do? Let's start writing. What we could do is we'll ease originals into our show and we'll start doing original shows around our work circuit as a cover band. So the two-prong attack. Okay, so we were going out and doing weekends mostly now. And what we did was we all moved to London. That's a whole other vlog, which is a good one, about the ranch where we all lived at um, some townhouses on Southdale Road. We had four or five townhouses that were all filled with musician friends. That's a vlog in itself, and I'll get to that another time. So we would rehearse through the week, and then Weekends where you go out and play. We started flipping these originals into the show and they started to go over. And then we would book stuff opening for recording acts where we could do a whole set of just originals. And we were still nasty class at this time. And then we had enough of a following in London area. Eventually we were doing headlining shows, playing three quarters originals with two or three covers in a 90 minute set with an opening act. So where we rehearsed was above a bar that Londoners will remember, a legendary bar called the Electric Banana. And here's how this worked. We had a room up there that we used. We were rehearsed pretty much every night of the week that we weren't gigging. So to pay for the rehearsal room, Sean, Stan, and I would play once a month downstairs in the bar, just playing covers as a trio, a loose version of Nasty Class, but we wanted it to be associated with Nasty Class. We called it something else. So we'd make up names. One of them was the Haggis Brothers, the Beer Nuts. Uh, uh, the others will come to me. But a lot of things, a lot of times we'd use brothers, something brothers, because we thought of ourselves that way as, you know. And it was to differentiate between the original act, the working band, and it didn't include Tim for that reason too. It was just like, you know, we're doing this to make a little extra money and to pay for the rent in a rehearsal room. So eventually, we decided the name Nasty Class, coming into the 90s, Grunge was starting to become popular, more serious music. Nasty Class is a cool name for the 80s, but it was, it was class with a K, by the way. Um, not to criticize, because it worked for a long time, but it was time to change. So here's the thing, Nasty Class, we said, we need, now that we're doing original shows and stuff, we can maybe still work as Nasty Class, but the original band's gotta be another thing. So we came up with the name, Stan came up with the name, The Bleeding Hearts. Which I fucking love to this day. I love that name. And uh, what happened now, this is the timeline gets screwed up here, but Tim McFadden was asked to leave. And it's a very a controversial subject, and I, and I hate even talking about it, because I love Tim, if you happen to be watching. Tim, I'm handling this as best as I can, but at the time it was just, there was this conflict and stuff going on. Tim, Tim was in love and, and it just wasn't working. So 
people in the band decided what changes needed to be made. I'll leave it at that. And um, there were made. So Tim stepped aside. We got around this time, Mike Bennell came back because he saw that we were writing original music. And the original music was very Rolling Stones ish, Stones -ish Aerosmith like. And around this time, the Black Crows were having great success. And this is a band that we felt akin to. We felt very much like a brotherhood with bands like that. Led to choir boys. There was a super awkward, old fashioned rock and roll was coming back. And Mike liked what he heard and he jumped back on board. And we got a guitar player named Derek Bowie from London, Ontario. He was a great, great slide player. So, here we go. Trains running down the track. We got the rehearsal room above the electric banana. The Bleeding Hearts are doing original shows. And we had filtered out the covers. We might do one or two a show. But we basically had enough popularity from the nasty class buildup that we could headline and play almost all originals. But that occasionally, two or three times a month, Sean, Stan, and I would go downstairs into the banana to pay the rent on our room and play as Haggis Brothers, Beer Nuts, uh, you know, a bunch of different names. We'd, we'd make up goofy names on the spot sometimes because we wanted a clear definition between the cover band, the paper bills, and the original band, okay? So then what happened was this. We found out that Roger Waters of Pink Floyd had a backing band called the Bleeding Heart Band, which meant we had to change it. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is where we came up with the next name, which was Paleface. See that behind me? Probably backwards. Okay. Now, you can see an EP and a poster up there on the wall. What happened was, the Paleface lineup was Derek Bowie on guitar. Great guitar player, great guy. Sean on guitar and vocals, Stan on bass, me and drums, and Mike Benal back on keyboards. That was when we really buckled down and said we're going to be a real band to write our own music. Okay? So Nasty Class became Bleeding Hearts. Bleeding Hearts became Pale Face out of necessity. Now at this point in time, we're starting to style out headlining shows as, as an original band in southwestern Ontario. And even doing well in Toronto. We could go play rock and roll, have places like that, and draw people with an opening act. So I had the brainstorm way. I said, you know what, guys? What we need to do is shop a finished record. Let's go to Dan Brodbeck, who owned DB Studios at the time, which is now called Charter House, and uh, just say, look, we want to do a spec deal with you, which is this. You give us the studio time to complete a record, and when we get signed, you get paid. If we don't get signed, we'll go back out as a cover band and work every weekend to pay off the record. And he knew our work ethic was good and our work was good and he agreed to that. So that's what we did. And we went to the studio and self-produced a record with Dan Brown back co-producing. And it was great. One of the best times of my life. It was awesome. And we continued to do these Haggis Brothers Beer Nuts shows, the three of us, just for fun every now and then and make a little extra money. Okay? So remember, they're two different bands, right? Now, this is another difficult part. Eventually, it wasn't my decision, but someone in the band decided that Derek Bowie wasn't working out. I never agreed with, this situation, with the uh, um, decision. And uh, I will say, in this person's defense, Derek did have a habit of, he was a little passive-aggressive about stuff. He felt like his ideas weren't being listened to. So him and I would go up to the rehearsal room. I would encourage him to write. I'd say, meet me in the rehearsal room an hour before rehearsal and show me your ideas when we run through them. And the rest of the band would come and I'd say, Derek, play the guys that song we were working on. And he wouldn't do it. He'd say, no, it's okay. And then he would complain after that he wasn't being listened to. So it was a little passive aggressive and strange. And also in the studio, we were, well, I don't think we were very patient with them. Some people, you know, the red light comes on, they call it red light fever and, they're, and they choke, they have a hard time. Derek was kind of like that. Looking back on it with the hindsight of adulthood, we should have been more patient and more encouraging and taking more time. So Derek, if you happen to see this, I apologize that because you're a fucking great musician, man. And you're a great guy. I never, I, I always wanted to work it out, but other stronger voices overcame mine. So anyway, now Derek's gone. So we reduced to a four piece, okay? Pale face. We recorded the album 
And then I put together the London Collins Showcase to call the office, and it was attended by every major label in Canada. I'm very proud of that. Publishing houses, management companies, agents. We stuffed half the Toronto, three quarters of the Toronto uh, recording industry under the roof of Call the Office one night. Four of the five bands got some kind of deal, whether it be record deal, publishing, or management. I was very proud of that we pulled that off. So we took our self-financed album, Attic Scientist with Pale Fans, cut us a check, paid off the record, gave Danny a $2,000 bonus. You know, which got a little bit of, each walked away with about $5,000 in our pocket after we bought a van and got merch made, shot a video, paid off the album, bought a trailer, bought new gear, all that stuff. So, the record sign, okay, and the record company says, what we're going to do is we're going to take four songs from that album and we're going to put them out as an EP, extended play, right there, okay, to hold the public over and, and kind of build an appetite for, for the album to come out. Because what had happened was, Universal being a parent company, we had to set a date for a release for the record, but the Tragically Hip had an album coming out that same day. And Attic wisely said, we're gonna wait another four or five months down the road to release your record. Because all of Universal's money and their staff and attention is gonna be on working the hip record. We want your album to get attention, so we're going to wait till it's a quiet period for them. So we'll put out the Pale Face EP in the meantime, which we did. That is this thing, they printed up a thousand copies, gave them to us free of charge, it wasn't recoupable. We got to sell them and keep the proceeds. But the kicker was we had to pretend it was an indie album, we, we couldn't pretend that it doesn't say Attic Records on it, right? Because back then having indie credibility was a big thing, and Capital had done the same thing with Moist. Financed an EP for them with Nudge Judge Wink Wink and said go out and Capital paid for everything to give them indie credibility and then put the album out while Attic was using the same battle plan. So the EP came out as Pale Face. And I guess what happened? We got a cease and desist letter from Atlantic Records in New York City. They had a solo acoustic back type artist called Pale Face Science. I said, we own the name. Cease and desist, mother trucker. So what happened was this, we were like, oh shit. And now the album artwork was done. Magic Incinerator was the name of the Buffalo Brothers album. But, sorry, Pale Face, Magic Incinerator was the name of the album. I just gave the whole story away there, but artwork was done and everything. They called us up and said, guys, they faxed me the letter. You gotta change the name and you gotta have something by Monday because it's going to the printers Monday and we need to change the artwork. You need a new name. Now I was gone away for a, like a week long tour. I'd go out and do tours with cover bands. I played with a Kiss tribute band called The Live that was very popular. And I was out with The Live just making some money doing some shows for a week. And uh, so the three of them got together, the other three guys got together while I was gone here. They got together here in London, had a meeting and they came up with the name Buffalo Brothers, which I hated. Now I'll get to that in a second. But the way we worked, we were true, you know, uh, majority rules, right? We were a true democracy. The three of them loved it, so that was the name. And that bugged the piss out of me for a long time. And it grew on me. Now I look back on that, and I know the reason it bothered me was because I always associated the brothers thing with the cover bands that we would do with the Electric Banana to just pick a stupid name to differentiate between our original music and our cover music. So I said, I don't want this to be a joke. Now I know, in hindsight, that was 2020, what they were aiming for was like a Neil Young Crazy Horse kind of vibe. Buffalo Brothers Crazy Horse. Stone Pony, right? An organic, earthy, Americana rock and roll kind of name. And then the name grew on me, and to this day, I don't hate it anymore, let's put it that way. It's not my favorite name, but it's still, it's much cooler than I gave it credit for. So there's how the same band, which essentially was Mike Bunnell, Sean Sanders, me and Stan, went from being Nasty Class, to Bleeding Hearts Band, to Pale Face, to Buffalo Brothers. And what a ride it was. 
one of the best times of my life, making music with time with my best friends that I literally did consider brothers. And uh, the ship's kind of gone on the rocks and we don't all speak to each other or see each other very often, which is a shame. We're coming up on some anniversaries in the next couple of years of, of the record and the band. And I'd really like to even do one off 30th anniversary show or something, let's put it that way, in 20, uh, 2027, 30th anniversary of the album. Or 2026. I have to check that out. But I'm not holding my breath for anything to happen. However, it was a great time in my life. And for that stretch of years from, you know, 89. That's about 99. You could ten year chunk I spent playing with those guys in various names and various uh, formats. And I wouldn't change a thing. If any of you four are watching this, I love all four, all, all three of you rather, if any of the four of us, if any of the three of you are watching, I love all three of you still to this day, even though a couple of us aren't speaking, <coughs> Sean, I still love you like a brother, and you drive me crazy like a brother, but I still love you, and the music we created means the world to me, and I'm still very, very proud of that album, Magic and Center, you can get it on iTunes, folks, we don't get any royalties from it, but... I still say go and listen to it because it's a damn good album one I'll always hold my head high about. Alright, thanks for joining me today. And I appreciate you listening to this ramble. It's 31 minutes, 26 seconds, so it's time for me to fuck off. But um, have yourselves a great night. If you could, if you haven't already, please hit subscribe. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. And also, I have a Patreon page. I'll put the uh, link in the description where I share really cool stories and stuff that I can't talk about on uh, open social media. Pictures, videos, stories from the road, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, fun stuff. It's $5 a month Canadian, $3 a month American. I'll finance my endeavors and uh, think about it as sitting down having a beer, buy me a beer and let's chatting about the road. So rock and roll everybody. And remember, I'm here, I'm alive, but I'm rusty.